Uh, hello everybody, thank you very much for coming to join us this evening for the uh, Old Oaks Lounge event. And this evening's topic is going to be about AI and the unavoidable future that it is. Uh, my name is Rory Atkinson, thank you very much for coming and for buying tickets and so on. And please, just as a reminder, uh, this is a discussionary panel. Uh, all the members on stage, aside from Sean, are uh, former students of, the, of some college of various years. Um, you can guess the years. And, uh, and Sean's a, a future parent, so he's not a current parent, but he is a future parent of Sons College. Um, thank you very much again for coming and for the whole team at the back there for helping organize everything. Um, if during the course of this evening, this is a lounge event, so please feel free to go grab some more wine. Uh, bathrooms are back there on the right hand side. Help yourself to some snacks and things and just enjoy yourselves. Um, and we will have a Q&A towards the end, so feel free to ask any questions there. If something pops into your head, uh, you'll be able to be given a chance to ask the, the panelists uh, whatever you would like to ask. And I'm just going to leave it up to Sean. Have a good evening. Again, uh, you know, to Rory for, for inviting me. So I'm newly back in South Africa after 23 years of, uh, you know, uh, working all over the world, predominantly in the UK, but lived in, you know, crazy places like Montecito and various places around the world. Um, and uh, yeah, we returned to South Africa with my three boys, who you know we are very much hoping are going to be uh, alumni of Somerset College at some point. Um, but just to give you a bit of background on myself, um, I run a company called Grow Global. Um, amongst others, um, and for the sort of Grow Global, what it does is it is an outsourced management company for franchise networks. So we work in about 14 countries around the world, and proudly South African team that uh, manages very, very large networks of 300, 400 franchisees. Um, you know, and we do everything. We, we look after them in total. Um, uh, as part of that, we we started a couple of years ago, just after, in fact, probably about 15 days after ChatGPT kind of launched, we, we started our own French uh, AI consultancy. And for the past two years, we've been creating products using the, you know, the AI that's available um, for, for um, you know, practical purposes. So right now, as we speak, we've got AI answering phone calls for retail stores. We work with Walmart really uh, closely um, and various other sort of instances. And, you know, the, the reality is that, uh, you know, I grew up in a tiny little place called Belfast near Dulstrup. I don't know if any of you guys know, know where that is. Um, and when I was growing up, um, you know, we still had an old school Nomorosavif phone. You know, we had to do the crank and speak to the lady. And it's amazing. I just asked where my mom was and she knew, right? She just put me straight through. Um, and so, you know, I count myself as incredibly fortunate in this era that we're living in right now. And that I've seen that. And today I'm creating AI products for, for real world applications, answering calls and doing all kinds of crazy things that I don't even know that it's not a human. I've created it and often it fools me. So, you know, from a, from a what do the kids call us? Gen Xs. Um, you know, uh, from that point of view, incredibly privileged to have seen this whole development of, of technology as it's, as it's been. But I'm also a dad, and every single time I create a, an amazing AI product that I'm just incredibly in awe of, two minutes later, I'm like, what have I done to my kids? Right? And that is one of the things that we're going to be talking about today in the inevitable future of, of AI, how this is all going to work, what we need to do, how we prepare ourselves. You know, uh, and these are very important questions because I, I truly believe that most of the world um, is suffering what uh, many of you guys will know, the boiling frog syndrome. Um, AI is, is quiet and it's moving rapidly, but most of the world doesn't actually know what's going on uh, in the background. Um, what I will just finish off with is, um, you know, one of the companies that I also own is a company called Skill Samurai. Uh, which is a STEM education business. Um, we're in five countries, including Singapore, New Zealand, Australia. Um, and we have an AI curriculum. We're going to be launching in South Africa in the next month or so. Um, and the AI curriculum, based on my own experience of how rapidly AI is moving, and um, I'm sure the gentleman on the panel will know, there's a, there was a thing, I believe, called Moore's Law that basically said that you know, technology is doubling you know, in its pace over, over the course of every year. 
I think that that's been blown out the water. Um, it is going much faster than any of us, uh, of us think. So, you know, with a, with a, with a skill samurai, we're trying to figure out how we can keep the kids um, uh, sort of advanced when it comes to this kind of technology. But tonight is about these guys over here. Um, you know, the breadth of their experience is, is incredible. Um, and, you know, each one of us in, in a different way are going to have a perspective on where this AI is going, what impact it might have, and most importantly, I hope, we're going to be able to, you know, deliver a pearl of wisdom or two, which will give us an insight as to how to prepare for something that most people are not preparing for. So anyway, without further ado, and just for the record, I thought, you know, just continuing with the theme of the evening, um, I have used ChatGPT for all of my questions tonight, uh, just to demonstrate the power of, of, uh, of uh, the, the AI. But listen, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start um, you know, with Jack over here. So just an introduction. So guys, uh, I'm just gonna give a brief introduction and then if you could just uh, you know, tell people a bit more about yourself. Uh, so Jack is a lawyer and co-founder and CEO of multiple law tech businesses, including uh, the Coon Legal and Legal Fundy. He's worked within AI in the AI sector has focused on modernizing legal structures in South Africa. So, Jack, take it away. Sure. Um, I suppose, the, as a start, that I think about um, where we came into the, the journey that was getting into AI and getting into kind of this world of automation. And when I initially did, probably about six years ago, if I look at the landscape of what we developed and what subsequently kind of espoused itself is that when we first started developing this notion of a conceptual idea about four or five years ago, there was nothing else in the market vaguely equivalent towards it. Most of the people we were engaging with was kind of basic chatbots that they could engage with at very superficial legal standards. What we tried to do then, and what I think we were ahead of the curve on, was realizing that the ability for AI to understand vast reams of information and vast reams of data was where we could start making a bit of a difference. And so it, wasn't, it isn't just looking at it from one scope, which is how do we get, get a question and regurgitate an answer, but how do we start using this data underneath it all to kind of inform a, a, a better series of return answers or return questions and to kind of take it into a, a newer realm of what it looked like. So if I look at the market at the moment where we're playing, there's probably about six or seven equivalents that have come around and granted, I think the, the market isn't necessarily discerning as to the, the, the quality or standard of the output, which is something that I think we, have to, that we may, might talk to in moments to come. But I suppose more so that you realize the, the, the economics of access to AI is ultimately what has been brought down in this landscape. In my impression, and, and I suppose just in terms of understanding it, AI has been around since the 90s. And it's not necessarily, or even earlier perhaps, but in terms of where economics led it to, to, it was only something that is available to kind of larger corporations and governments and the like. And so suddenly what we're in this age of at the moment is I think of moving into the space where it's much easier from an economic perspective to release models or release alternatives into the market, whether they have LLMs behind them, large language models behind them, or they're riding into their own version, there's, I suppose, the, the, the opportunity base which it represents at the moment is quite eye-opening and fruitful for this discussion. Um, yeah, it's been a very interesting journey, I, I suppose, mine coming into this. Um, I think what we realized that it's not necessarily looking at it in its isolation, but how do we look at it from kind of a total value chain? So we, in terms of a legal landscape, initially we came in thinking that we'd try out-compete the lawyers. But I think what we realized is that we actually needed to start working with the lawyers and working with the community to try and see how we could create efficiencies and how do we kind of make their job a lot easier. How do we look at what their pains are and work into that landscape. Um, so yeah, it's been a very interesting journey from that side of it to broadening out the scope to understanding how do people interact with beings like this, with intelligence like this. Um, how do we look at that from a trust landscape, from a behavioral landscape. Um, and yeah, cool, interesting journey. Oh, perfect. All right, so next we have Pete Turner, co-founder of Beeline, an AI-first workplace training company. 
he focused on leveraging AI to help companies unlock their human potential by easily creating functional job training and learning experiences. And let me just tell you, I've, mm -hmm. I've touched on this, this uh, world and it is unbelievable what it can achieve. So please take it away, Pete. Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me here. Um, yeah, co-founder of Dila and Peter Turner. Um, and yeah, we do uh, AI and education essentially, but in the workforce training, uh, uh, like adult learning. Uh, I think it's a super interesting space uh, for AI and specifically the generative AI we have now. I think it's probably going to make the biggest impact in education and probably the biggest impact geographically in Africa where there's such a big um, educational like access problem. Um, so it's a very interesting space to be very excited about it. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's, it's, it is properly phenomenal. And uh, yeah, thanks for, for coming. Um, next, we're going over to Adrian uh, Stanford, Chief Technology Officer at ESET South Africa. He advocates for a proactive approach to cybersecurity, emphasizing the importance of staying ahead of emerging threats through continuous innovation and research. That is a hell of an intro. <laughs> I thought. Yeah, so have some delusions of grandeur in that <laughs> intro. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks very much for having me. It's an extremely, extreme privilege to be here. Um, perhaps if I can just contextualize myself a little bit better. Um, so at ESET Southern Africa, we are, we're a distribution arm of a global cybersecurity brand, and we distribute into South Africa and 23 other countries in sub-Saharan Africa. I think my part of this discussion is largely going to be you know, informing a slightly different lens of AI, you know, which is less about the uh, direct and exciting innovations of large language models like Pete and Jack are, are doing, um, but more about how does, how does AI and specifically more recently Gen AI, Gen AI inform the cybersecurity landscape. Um, it's quite a, quite a lot to unpack, but fundamentally it's really, it's a good and a bad thing. So AI helps us and it harms us. Uh, we've been using AI uh, in various forms for over 25 years in our products. Um, and Gen AI has offered a new tool set, uh, to, uh, an assistive tool set, let's say, uh, in cyber defense, but it's also an assistive tool set to cyber attackers. So it really is a double-edged double sword. And um, uh, where it puts us now is perhaps not quite as alarming as the hype would have you believe, but the future remains uncertain. And what is certain is that we have to pay a very close attention to it. Thank you. Um, right, and last but not least, Ben Blaine, founder and CEO of Neurobuild, a South African-based hardware and software consultancy called Neurobuild, working on a range of exciting products and applications with Western Sydney University in Australia. So, cool. welcome, Ben. <laughs> uh, it's very nice to be here. Um, this is where I went to school. I think that might be a prerequisite of being on the stage. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, that might be obvious. Um, yeah, I, whoever you has used SnapScan. Yeah, so that was my first thing that I worked on that became, that wasn't a complete failure. Um, and, um, an interesting thing happened with SnapScan was it was the fourth time we made a payments app. Um, and basically we started with like four buttons and then each time we removed the button and when we got to one button, it worked, which is kind of like the iPhone. It's like, you know, <laughs> just have one button <laughs> and can you make it work with one button and how do you make it work with one button? Um, so I love simplicity and I, and I, I wanted to add buttons when I got to SnapScan and then I, and I was told by wiser people to not add buttons and to just have the one button and do one thing, which is pay. It used to do other things like vouchers and all these things. So I love simplicity and I love building simple products, um, which for better or worse has now got me running this consultancy that works with Western Sydney University, particularly a department there called the International Center for Neuromorphic Systems. Um, I still have to ask their marketing manager what they were thinking, but, um, and what's interesting about this department is they, the guy who started this thing actually worked with, um, the, the founders of the field of perception of the study of perception <laughs> and perception is what preceded, um, AI. So basically people at some point were like, let's study how we see things. Let's study how we hear things. Let's study how we taste things and so on. Um, and figure out how that biologically works. And then because computers were coming up and um, electronics were coming up at the same time, it very quickly became a question, can we mimic this with computers and technology? And then 
on the computer science information side, they're like, well, can we just give computers all of the knowledge of the world and make an artificial intelligence? And that didn't work, and that kind of died out in the 70s. Um, and then there was like a cold era of AI for 10 or 20 years. And then more recently, um, this uh, thing called machine learning came along, which was like, don't teach the computer anything. Give it the ability to learn. Um, and therefore, you can now feed it information, and it will learn that information. You can feed it sight. You can give it a camera. You can give it um, like text. Uh, you can give it images. You can give it sound. And, it, and you can then teach it, get, uh, get it to guess what it thinks it is seeing or hearing or reading or, or saying and tell it when it's wrong or tell it when it's right. And this kind of um, exploded and totally eclipsed um, this field called neuromorphic engineering, which is can we recreate biological sensors with electronics and computers? So it's kind of weird because it's kind of old school what we do in a way. <laughs> um, we are building satellite uh, obser miniature observatories that can observe satellites um, and detect what kind of satellites they are from the ground. Um, we are working with um, building reading apps for kids that listen to how they read and simply says this kid can or can't read and this is the words that they do or don't know. So you can help them through learn the words they don't know. Um, we're building... Um, a device which listens, like, this is the oddest of them, but um, can listen to the environment and tell you if there's koalas in the area, um, <laughs> which uh, Andrew Lothian in Australia is very grateful for because he doesn't have to stand in a paddock with <laughs> knee-deep in muck for 10 hours trying to count koalas. Um, <laughs> so I like simple products. Um, I am not convinced that AI is going to kill everyone and everything, and if it does, well, we're all screwed anyway, so... Might as well just enjoy the ride. Um, and, but I do believe in humanity. We'll, that we'll figure it out. And sorry for the very long introduction, but that's me. No, it's just wonderful. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's always been interesting to me how, especially the people from the AI, AI industry are like, well, you know, don't worry. What it is, is it's just guessing the next word. Well, I can tell you in my experience, I've met a number of humans that do exactly the same thing. So as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> you know, it's, it's pretty much on par. But guys, um, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the big picture, first of all. As I said, you know, ChatGPT did a great job of giving questions here. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm going to kick this thing off because we're going to talk about the industries and everybody's perception. But the first thing to say is, you know, there are, there are some stats out there that are pretty damn alarming, you know. And one of them, two of them, in fact, uh, Goldman Sachs and McKinsey, the big research house, um, you know, they, they did some research about this AI and automation and what the impact is going to be on the on the world and their, their estimations, in fact, they're currently arguing about who's right, but they're estimating anywhere between 300 and 800 million job loss, uh, losses in um, five years by 2030. This is what, they, what they're talking about. And um, you know, the, 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 the interesting thing is about this, and I'm, I'm sure you know, some of the panel would have seen this too. Um, uh, this is very different to 2008, back in the day when uh, you know, there was the dot-com crash and there was huge amounts of PR and, and all that kind of thing, talking about the, you know, how many people were laid off. This is a silent, very, very silent one. I know that because three days ago, I had two graduates from MIT wanting to open a kids learning franchise. So there's a lot of the, the tech sector and everything like that that are quietly kind of uh, losing their jobs. This is not necessarily a bad thing because, you know, uh, I'm going to use what, what uh, Somerset College over here has given me as a gift. Um, you know, in my view, I've been in, involved in opening businesses for 23 years now. Over 2,000 businesses I've helped uh, open around the world. And that first banner over there saying entrepreneurship, um, you know, in my humble opinion, is the single most powerful tool that we can give our kids right now, the understanding of it. Um, because what it does is it changes mindsets and it makes people think in a different way where we may not be qualified as uh, adults in many ways to think or predict what's going to happen in the future, what we can do is equip our kids with the thinking processes and the critical thinking that will allow them to very easily identify the gaps in the market, right? So, you know, without further ado, I'm going to go over to Jack and I'm going to say, what, what impact um, do you foresee within the, within the legal sector, um, you know, how people are using AI? Is there a future for lawyers? Um, doing things like commercial law, etc. Um, and you know, how do you see that going? Yeah, so I, well, I suppose the first side of it is that 
to, I think, state that I think there always will be a need. If I, if, maybe let's broaden this, I suppose, to kind of a service-based industry where I'm thinking about doctors or thinking about lawyers. Um, so within that space, or currently what the, what the status quo is, and within South Africa, at least, is in the last two years, only 9% of our population that had a legal issue has been able to access a legal profession. So there's quite fundamentally an issue with the, with the structures that we are existing in at the moment. Um, and where I see, I suppose, the benefits of, of something of bringing AI into this landscape, and I think where we try to attach into it, is actually say, well, how do we kind of flip that power dynamic? So it's not just saying, here's access to information in a more uh, kind of understandable version, or, but rather actually looking at it from a kind of total value chain perspective and saying, where are the spaces that, that people are playing at the moment? Why aren't they accessing in the right way? And so as soon as we've implemented components like getting an initial response to your scenario and then finding a paralegal or lawyer in your local vicinity, that's gone up to about 60%. So the immediate position there is that it's, there, there isn't not a huge um, shift in necessarily in how people are accessing. In the past, people are going to Google, they're typing in this legal scenario and they're getting taken through some random website. Whereas the other side of that is you can actually say there's a kind of singular portal where you can then be directed into the landscape that you need to go into. And so from my perspective, I, I suppose the, if I look at this from a short-term, long-term perspective, short-term, I don't think there's anything to worry about as things stand. But I think what's going to happen in time to come is that there's going to be a huge kind of drive for efficiency. If I'm looking at the legal profession, it's that my turnaround on documentation drafting is going to have to be an hour because I've now got this base that I can pull from and I can draft it. So you've got to, you've got to find this balance, I think, between what kind of consumers or users or people at the, at the base side are looking at. And on the other side of that is going what currently exists. And we can't go too quickly into that this. There needs to be a kind of transitionary process towards that, which I think is a little bit of maybe where the conversation is too far looking at the future and rather going, how do we adapt into this landscape um, and, and, and bring that world towards us rather than trying to jump headfirst into it necessarily. And your, your, your belief is, and I, I think this is a brilliant one, is that you know, this technology may just give more people access to better information for less so that they can they can be better represented when things come up. And maybe, you know, I, I know this myself, and I think probably many people are the same, that, you know, it's quite an intimidating thing deciding to go to a lawyer. Yeah. And maybe this is that, that bridge that kind of softens the transition into getting the personalized attention from, a, from an attorney. Exactly, exactly. And I, and I think when you, when you pair that with some kind of social intera interaction around what you're doing, where I can actually start looking at it much maybe like an Uber model where I can see how other people of similar demographic to me have interacted with a certain lawyer. We start looking at AI not as this kind of tool in isolation that's just propelling us forward, but rather that's something that's contributing quite significantly, but contributing to this, this space that allows me more power, more understanding, and I suppose a greater sense of what is the right direction for me. And quicker access to information, right? And quicker access to information. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, Peter, so, so going on to the training side of things, I mean, you know, this has been a nightmare for me personally, trying to train people, um, literally just trained a guy in Egypt, um, you know, earlier. And it is, it is quite a thing when you've got people from around the world, uh, you want to train them on a particular system, it's a particular thing. Um, you know, it seems to me completely logical to have um, you know, the AI tools to help with the training, but um, I suppose not necessarily do the training in total, but really get people to a certain level so that the, the last mile, I suppose you call it in the training, can be done by the individual company or the people in there. Is that right? Yeah, I think um, there's a couple trends that are happening with AI. Uh, the one being that it's almost like at least generative AI, it's almost like allowing companies to create like uh, uh, these factories that produce information of specific structures. Um, and that, what that means is that um, systems or, or, or services and products that companies create are, are going to become um, less like procedural. Mm -hmm. So, so it, like if you're building a house, uh, how you know you'd always build a house is, you know, you'd have a list of things that need to be done in order. 
uh, you'd go and lay the bricks, um, you'd go and like, well, lay the foundation, lay the bricks. Um, I think the tr the one trend because of this fact that 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 everything's um, you're getting like these these the ability to create like structured information very quickly is like it's becoming more declarative mm -hmm. in nature. So instead of saying instead of uh, like giving the plans to build a house, you can specify what house you want um, and have it build it. And that's a kind of a, a, a um, like a what's the word? Um, like it's going to be more in the information realm, mm. um, but the the point still stands, I think. And in the training space, uh, what it means, like a lot of the, the the effort and like work in the training space is like content development and like developing the right content and localized content for the the specific business in question. Um, and if it moves to a more declarative sort of uh, makeup of systems, you won't be assigning or creating content anymore. Uh, you'll be feeding, you'll almost be throwing stuff into this like bin, you know, and, and assigning rather, or declaring what you want trained, like mm. assigning skills um, and assigning business outcomes. Um, and the, the, the engine or factory in that case for this specific business would be uh, like high quality functional training that aligns with your business outcomes or the skills you want to teach. Um, but that's, I think, going to be true across different industries. But I definitely agree with what Jack's saying in that it's it's really just going to enhance human, um, like create. It's going to let humans do a lot more um, because a lot of this, the building of the house is a lot of work. That uh, it's like whenever you want to do something, um, there's always a part of it where you like, I know exactly what I want to do, and I know it's going to take me like 15 hours. You know, and like that's work that you know. But if you could just like make it happen, because you know exactly what you're going to do, you have the plan to do it. Like th that's going to become shorter. So people are going to be able to do uh, do stuff a lot quicker by by having systems that use a lot of like declarative components, mm -hmm. where you're not um, following a sequence of tasks, but more declaring what you want quite specifically, uh, and and at least in the information realm. Yeah. Um, so like these tokens that it's generating could be. Um, <laughs> You know, they could be training, but they also could be like uh, articulation uh, uh, controls in robots or something like, or, or like, you know, it could, it's like, a, it's almost like uh, it was a video I was watching, uh, the NVIDIA CEO was, was talking about this, that he was just talking about it kind of as an industrial revolution where um, these factories, they don't take in like the first industrial revolution took in steam and sort of outputted electrons. Mm. And those electrons were used in all these industries as electricity, powered all these businesses. Now it's like you're inputting, informa you're inputting data and information and you you're getting out uh, like a different form of information, like structured information in the form of tokens, which could be anything. Yeah. Um, so so in, my, in my instance, I said, what questions should I ask in order not to look like a fool? That was my declaration. <laughs> but what I what I what I am really excited about in the training space is the is the you know and we're doing this with Skill Samurai. We we we're working on this project called the the, the, the um, School of the Future, where individual people can be taught based on their learning style. So you know, in an old school way, like back in ancient Greece, where you know all the greatest minds had a tutor that went with them from six to eighteen. And, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's something that is entirely possible. In fact, um, the other day I had uh, my son come to me and say, well, Dad, please can you help me? Uh, you know, he's grown up in England. Trust me, the education is very different over there. Um, he's like, what is a factor? You know, and I was about to go on a Zoom call or whatever, and I was like, oh, I can't do it. Hold on a second. I got on my phone. I pressed the voice-activated chat GPT, and I said, my son's 12 years old. He really needs to understand what factors are. Please can you teach him, don't give him the answers um, and give him a test afterwards and I carried on and I was just listening in the corner, uh, you know, from, from, from the side and my God, it was amazing. It was incredible how it's trained him, how it's empathized with him getting it wrong and all of these things, which I, like, I was completely blown away. I didn't know it was capable of doing these things. So, um, yeah, very, very interesting space. But um, into uh, probably a more interesting space and that is with Adrian. And we're talking about, uh, you know, information security. And now um, Adrian and I had a discussion earlier and we were talking about uh, one of the, the areas that, that petrify me, um, which is the deep fakes of uh, voice and face and all these kind of things. 
I'm going to tell you a little anecdote. It was an American senator. And, um, you know, he, he got a phone call from his son saying, Dad, I'm in deep, deep trouble. And, uh, and she was like, well, what's happened? Very panicky sound from, from his son. Um, and he said, I'm, I've been in an accident and I've hit somebody and they're in critical condition. I've been arrested. Um, you, need to, you need to come help me, right? Bail me out or something. Can you call the, the, you know, the courthouse and get me bail or whatever? And it's the senator. He's got some cash, right? Um, and so he's like, yes, of course. And the son gives him a number. He phones the courthouse. The courthouse answers. And they're like, oh, I'm so sorry, Senator. But as you know, you know, it's one minute past five. We don't do anything after five o'clock. Um, you know, if you want to do something, please call so-and-so. Um, you know, the, the judge or whatever directly. Anyway, so he's about to phone. He gets the number. He's about to phone the, phone the judge. And he thinks, oh, God, my daughter-in-law doesn't know what's going on. So he sends her a WhatsApp message and he's like, listen, you know, Jack is, uh, he's okay. Uh, he's been in an accident. He's got a broken nose. <laughs> and, um, but he's safe. Don't worry. I'm sorting it, you know, kind of thing. And he's dialing the number for the, for the judge and his son phones him and he's like, dad, what the hell are you on about? Right? He's like, I'm fine. What are you, what are you, what are you going on about? So his son was a YouTuber. Right, and he had spent uh, a lot of time, obviously, you know, doing his videos. What these guys had done is they found out who his dad was. They would taken all the YouTube videos. They deep faked his voice to the extent where his father had no idea that he was not speaking to his actual son. Mm -hmm. Right, um, and that that was one of those moments for me, at least, where I spoke to my my, my family and I was like, guys, we need a safe word. Like when we when we when we answer the phone, just say Deludo or something. You know, just so I know it's you. Um, I know it's exaggerating and everything like that, but this is happening. It is absolutely happening. People that are phoning my customers answering the AI, uh, that have been having their phone calls answered by the AI that I've created, 95 to 98% of them have absolutely no idea that they are not speaking to a human. You know, I even got a guy to rush off to one of the shops to uh, get his PlayStation fixed because he had a tournament and the AI convinced him to get to the shop before the closing time. You know, it's an interesting listen. But um, so, Adrian, going on to you after that monologue, um, <laughs> why don't you tell us a bit about the, the information security side of the AI? And, you know, of course, there's the traditional security threats that, uh, you know, I'm sure anybody in the business has had to look at. But what about these others? These, these, these ones where, like, you know, I don't even know if you're real if you're on Zoom. <laughs> oh, I, I'm real, I promise. Um, Sean, maybe I just want to pick up on a comment you made earlier, which was to reference a, a Goldman Sachs research, uh, you know, saying between three and 300 and 800 million jobs being lost. And <laughs> I, you know, another thing Goldman Sachs said about a year ago was that AI was going to raise GDP by 7% in the US, and now a year later they significantly backtrack that. So <laughs> I think my point is, um, you know, any predictions about the future should be considered uh, speculatory at best, and perhaps we shouldn't look to Wall Street analysts to <laughs> uh, uh, um, be the tech, the leaders in tech. Um, but more specifically to your question, um, Look, you know, your anecdote about deep fakes is, uh, is spot on. You know, I, we, we've got a researcher, and by we I mean the ESA Global team, uh, who does exactly what you're talking about as part of his job to demonstrate the feasibility of using this kind of technology, deep fakes. So, and he's, he's, I've seen him do some fascinating conference talks where he has described how he'll go to a friend of his, so he'll go to his friend and be like, Ben, can I, you know, ask permission, Ben, can I, uh, with your permission, you know, hack into Neurobill? And his friend will say, hey, okay, sure. Because he knows he's doing it for you know research purposes, and then he'll go off, and uh, he has successfully used uh, voice AI deepfakes to um, uh, create WhatsApp voice notes. Uh, effectively, you know, if I if you imagine that I socially engineered my way into a, to do a SIM swap to get uh, Ben's SIM card, which means I can get into his WhatsApp, which means I can then um, from his WhatsApp create a voice note that sounds like Ben, and then send it to his financial manager at his business say, hi, please can you pay me a thousand rand or 10,000 rand. And uh, this guy, Jake Moore, has done that successfully, you know, for fun, for the sake of demonstrating the purpose. He has done the same thing with video. He has uh, taken another friend, he's kind of running out of friends. <laughs> uh, he's got another friend and uh, managed to hack his way into that, um, into his friend's business premises and change the CCTV footage so that it didn't look like him. And there's a very fantastic, um, 
a photograph of him sitting at the boardroom table with his feet up, and, you know, relaxing there, and people were offering coffee. No one was wiser that he was not supposed to be there. And uh, he decided to take it a step further and decide, you know, well, maybe can, can you monetize this using this, this deep fake video technology? And uh, so the owner of this business was very into cycling, and there were a couple of YouTube videos of him as part of his business and as part of his hobby. So he was able to, in a similar fashion to Sean's anecdote, create a very realistic looking deep fake video of this guy. You know, in his cycling gear, looking like he's out somewhere on location, you know, with his cycling team, announcing that he was going to take a three month sabbatical and cycle from the UK to Australia. And he, <laughs> he then hacked into this guy's LinkedIn, uh, put it on, posted it on LinkedIn, and within 24 hours, he had people offering money, setting up sponsorships, a, a whole load of stuff. Now, this was all kind of harmless and amusing. What's not so amusing is, are the real world stories where I think somewhere in in Taiwan or Singapore, there was a business where they had managed to um, create a Zoom call which combined both the voice and video deepfakes to uh, mimic the CFO of this company. And then on a Zoom call, he was requesting payments of one, 1.5 million US dollars to various uh, different accounts. And it was only at the point when they had paid, already paid 25 million US dollars that they realized, hang on, this is not right. And then they realized it was a scam. So yeah, deepfakes just on its own are a pretty alarming aspect of generative AI that have come into the cyber landscape. And as Sean has mentioned, it's actually quite well, he's alluded to it at least, it's difficult to mitigate. You know, the use of safe words is quite a, a novel way of doing it. I'm certainly, I think that's very creative. Um, and, and certainly, you know, I wouldn't say that we have technical tools yet um, that are that effective. Um, more generally speaking though, there's a whole host of other uh, ways that AI have, have helped us in the cybersecurity landscape, but also made our lives more difficult. But I think I've maybe spoken enough on that. So yeah, that's <laughs> my comment. <laughs> Good. So um, Ben, I'm I'm really interested in, as to why you want to figure out what satellites are there. I'm fairly certain it's got to do with missiles, but anyway, that's a separate <laughs> <laughs> or, or star. Um, but yeah, why don't you why don't you give us your your view? Um, you know, you've got a very different perspective, and you know, your experience obviously is is uh, different to, to the rest of the panel here. Mm. Um, what, are you, what are you thinking you know, over the course of the next sort of 10 years? Uh, you know, we've had, the, we've had this, this, the scares from the, from the Wall Street guys. Um, whether they're right or not, uh, really honestly, the only thing that's gonna decide that is time. Um, but what is your perspective on how AI is, is good and bad? And I'm gonna take you to the next question also about the ethics of um, how it's used, used and you know, what we really should be thinking when we implement things like AI into businesses. Well, uh, okay, the first thing is, AD has now convinced me that AI is going to kill us all. <laughs> 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 um, and uh, the second thing is, you really shouldn't be asking me about ethics because I'm a rule breaker. So, um, there was a time, sorry, I'm just going to go off topic, but when we were getting Snapscan off the ground, um, we were working with Standard Bank and they really wanted us to use these silly mobile like bank accounts attached, attached to cell phone numbers. So the first hundred stores, I signed up the first hundred stores. So the, the stores I went to, I was like, can you use this thing? People will pay with their phone here. I promise you I'm going to send some people here. I'm going to give them vouchers because um, no one was using it yet. Um, and, but can you accept the money to your cell phone number and then you just have to send the money to your bank account? And they were like, can you just put the money in, in my bank account? And we were, and I was like, no. And then by the third store, I was like, you know what? Yes, the money will just go into your bank account. So I signed up the first hundred stores on my cell phone number and I received all the money. And then every night I would just sit there on internet banking and deposit the money into their accounts. <laughs> and um, the one night I paid, luckily the one night I paid, I gave um, um, a merchant a double payment. So I, I paid them twice by mistake. And, um, and the reason I did this was because um, I wanted to make Snapscan successful and I didn't like people who told me that, I, that you know, are we going to have to do, we can't do that. And I was like, well, then you can't have a business because <laughs> um, like no one's going to use this thing. Um, so then, I mean, I had to own up to the CEO and tell him that I'd been doing this as a hack away around the system. Um, he was very upset. I didn't realize <laughs> how bad this was. <laughs> But it did mean that within two days, we had a direct to the bank, um, direct to bank account depositing system built by the software team. And um, I'm not sure that Snapscan would, would have existed if we hadn't broken 
the rule, well, I haven't broken the rules on that. So um, in terms of ethics, um, <laughs> um, geez, I mean, that's such a broad question. Do you, is, like, don't, don't. Is there, is there, um, you know, people? are there, look, breaking, breaking, breaking the rules and doing things that harm humans yeah. are, you know, two different things. One, one is progress. And yeah. the other one is um, just pure harm. Um, you know, when you listen to everything that we've all said and, you know, we're speaking about, um, do you believe that there should be some form of oversight uh, when it comes to the development of, of um, AI products and, you know, all these amazing things that are coming out? Just the ability for a human being sat in Somerset West mm. to create an AI that nobody knows isn't human. Should there be some oversight from things like that? This is a very tricky topic because I am a, a radical individualist um, and I believe that uh, each person should have equal power to create. And if someone's not going to be allowed to create something, who's saying that they can't create that? Who's that person? And, no. are, and are they allowed to create it? And who the hell are they to say that you can't create it? So this is a tricky question. I do believe strongly in regulation. I do believe that they're strongly in oversight. I stay far, as far away from it as possible because it's very boring for me. It's for other people. Um, but I do uh, believe in it. I mean, if we didn't have regulation, then who knows what, what I would have ended up doing. <laughs> um, it forces us to make things safe uh, eventually. Um, I think that we need to give as much power to each individual person as possible. Um, I think it's, I don't know, it gets kind of weird and silly when you kind of say, well, chat GPT shouldn't tell you how to make a nuclear bomb. Because um, if you really want to make a nuclear bomb, you could probably go and figure it out anyway. But I don't know, that's a tricky one. So I don't really know, you know, that's ethics discussions and, and things. I believe in it. And Well, theoretically, kids that were born in 1901 were the ones who invented that nuclear bomb anyway. Yeah. You know, and there's a big argument to say that we have regressed quite substantially when it comes to development of new I'm very, things. I'm very afraid of regression, yeah. of, say, of having so many rules that no one thinks anymore, um, and no one learns, and everyone's too scared to do things, and they're just like, I don't know if you, you said you've been to the UK. I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I left. I left. Exactly. I mean, that's why I love South Africa, because yeah. there's not so many. Well, I, I, I must say that. And South Africans are exceptional on the world stage. Yeah. And it's because there's just not so many rules, and you can get hurt by stuff, and you have to learn how to not be hurt by stuff. I, I have to say that really America could benefit from you, because when I, when I moved to Santa Barbara, um, I opened my bank account and they gave me a checkbook. <laughs> I was like, what is this? Like, I don't even know how to fill one of these in anymore. Um, South Africa is massively advanced compared to the rest of the world in banking and payments yeah. and things like that. So it's actually a very, very, very cool thing. But listen, I'm going to go on to the panel and I'm going to kind of make this a bit, of, bit more of an open discussion because actually the only thing that really matters, like the life is over for us. We, we all know that, right? But what about the kids? Um, and how do we best prepare the, the, the kids, these guys sitting over here, um, you know, my, my, my three young boys, how do we prepare them uh, mentally and in terms of their, their critical thinking capabilities and also their preparedness for this technology um, to make sure that they have a fighting chance uh, when they hit adulthood. The, the, the theory being that people my age are more than likely, because of whatever the world is doing, going to be competing for the same jobs as my kids when they graduate. Um, you know, so what do, you, what do you think, Jack? What do you, how would you prepare your kids? Well, I, I suppose the first side of it is that to be prepared means you have to have explored, you have to have engaged and, and engaged critically. Um, so I suppose from a... From the, the first side of it there in my mind is, is how do we create kind of conducive environments that are, as you say, allowing the, 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 the person that's free roaming and free thinking to be able to play in the game without this kind of fear of, of hurting people ultimately. And, uh, from, a, from a longer term landscape there, I think the, it does need to be exist with, within a kind of regulatory environment, within an ethical environment. So, how do we prepare people for it? It's, 
I think it's it's more about how do you create a society that's that's understanding of it, in my impression. I think I'm coming from the education side, I've probably a better perception there, but it's it's creating a world where I suppose we aren't fearful or fearful for what it holds and where it's gonna take us, but more so that we have this ability to engage in it, understand it within some kind of box, some kind of, kind of framework of what can be done, what can can't be done. I mean, if we, if we, if we talk to the atomic bomb component there, there's, there's, there's huge regulations that stop people from building these in their back garden. So there is this kind of balance of world that we need to exist in, ultimately. Well, let me, let me ask you this question. How do we define or, or, or scope out regulation without them? <laughs> <laughs> where, do we, where do we put that mark? Right, and what we say to our children today, so bearing in mind what, 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 where I'm getting here is that, you know, if we imagine that technology as we know it today and the, the you know, common man technology is progressing at a speed that is just unbelievable, you know, can we put constraints on what we encourage our children to explore and try? Yeah, well, I mean, so... I think for the first time in, in my recollectable history, at least, and, and going back to just for my time, is it's, it's very... What, what we're entering into now is quite an unprecedented era surrounding the ability for regulation and ethics and the like and understanding to match the advancement of where technology is going through. Generally, how regulation happens, something goes wrong, we develop some guidelines, guidelines get rolled out, and we turn that into regulation. And that process in a traditional landscape takes five to ten years. So then you are important. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, but, and, and, I, and, I, and I think through kind of the, the work I'm doing and engaging within these, within these spaces, what I've realized is that most of the companies that we're engaging with aren't looking at where's AI in ten years' time. They're looking at what's happening with AI now, how do we adapt into this landscape? And so when we start looking at how do we prepare for a 10-year horizon, no one really knows what that horizon looks like. And so it's how do we prepare for it? I think we prepare for it by having active conversations around it now, by being willing to engage with it at this level and being, I suppose, open to adapting with it as it goes. Ultimately, I don't, it's, it's very hard to conceive the future, if you know what I mean. And so yeah. how do we adapt into a space we don't know. Well, we've, we've got to, I suppose, become comfortable in what that space holds and learn to resist with it. Yeah. Well, you've been so eloquent, so I'm going to do the hospital pass over <laughs> to Peter over there. Um, so, Peter, what could you tell your eight-year-old self today? What skill or what, what uh, information or what education would you tell your eight-year-old self to learn today to be successful in 10 years' time? Um, I'm going to throw out another study that uh, I could be getting mostly wrong, but it's, it's, um, it was something like in, in five to ten years, like 30% of the skills in the workforce uh, will be redundant, uh, and that's going to carry on happening. Um, I mean, even, even if it's not 30% or 40%, like there is going to be a vast uh, translation of what skills are needed because of all the new jobs that are going to be needed. I actually think there's going to be need for more jobs. I don't think in like previous big technological shifts, it's ever, it, 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 people like working, like they like, yeah, you yeah. know, they'll just do other stuff. Um, uh, there is a, obviously a, 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 a risk of people getting like left behind uh, in terms of like what opportunity they have. Um, but I, in essence, I think because this shift's gonna carry on happening, the real skill that people need to learn is learning new skills quickly, like mm. being adaptable. Yeah. Um, so, so, yeah, like adaptability, the ability to learn and like be comfortable uh, doing that often is going to be more necessary than in the past. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I, 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 I must say that I think that the, the, the future of how kids should learn is based on the fact that nothing is going to be valid three weeks from now. You know, <laughs> and, and, and just keep learning that way. So, Adrian, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to chuck that same question to you. Um, you know, what would you do today differently, or uh, if anything, um, to kind of prepare yourself for a, for a, a future where, and, and we had a discussion earlier with one of the gentlemen over here, where one of my first businesses, I, 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 I was very lucky to win the Amazon account in the UK. 
We had 800 South Africans that I was in the queues working in all the warehouses and customer services across the UK. Um, and now <laughs> there's 34 in that same, oh, sorry, in that, in that same warehouse. Um, and it's all automated. So what, what skills would you encourage yourself to learn uh, today for 10 years from now? Well, firstly, uh, I can confirm that Ben has his, for his whole life been a rule breaker. I was at school with him, and I don't think there was a single math class where Miss Jacobs didn't either give you detention or send you out. <laughs> uh, but uh, as Ben has pointed out, it's led to him to have quite a remarkable career. Uh, more on topic to the question, though. Um, I, I, okay, so I think Pete has nailed it in, in the sense that the core skill is adaptability, and then you, Sean, you picked up on that and said, well, you know, there's going to be a new kind of paradigm where uh, the, the core understanding or the core premise of life will be that nothing's static, and uh, the, the core uh, skill will be learning how to learn, and, and learning how, you know, information is going to be commoditized. So information will be freely available, and it's more about, you know, um, how, uh, how you then use that information, you know, in a dynamic environment. I, I, I thought about this a lot, though. Uh, look, I'm not a parent, right? Um, I, I have a nephew, though, and he's, he's two years old, and I, I discuss with my brother all the time, you know, the future about how we see him growing up and how he's going to be educated. And the one thing I always say to him uh, is that you, know, you do need to give kids credit for being a product of their environment, you know, in the sense that if you look at different generations and the environments they've grown up with, then when they grow up in a certain paradigm, it's a lot easier for them to be accustomed to that and to be adapted to that environment. So, you know, we grew up with the internet, well, our generation a little bit with, a little bit without, but it wasn't that difficult for us to adapt into that environment. Meanwhile, generations above us really struggled. And I have to wonder, even though this is not quite the same, it's maybe an order of magnitude more, but I have to wonder if the next generation is not going to, you know, if it already exists, be born into that generation or born into that paradigm, have a slightly easier time from a very young age, you know, being brought up with, okay, adaptability is paramount. Mm. So I, I do think it's something that warrants serious consideration. I think critical thinking is absolutely paramount. I think adaptability and being able to learn uh, is paramount. Um, I will just respond to something you said earlier, which is, you know, that older and younger people might be competing for the same jobs in the future. And this is just my opinion, but I, I'm not sure I necessarily agree because I do think as one gets older, one accrues certain skills that are not necessarily knowledge-based. I think emotional skills are not skills that are easily commoditized by AI and are not easily taught. And I think that is usually what is a primary differentiator between somebody who's older, wiser, and more experienced and perhaps somebody who's a little bit young and naive. So, yeah, I think those are my comments. For sure. So, um, Ben, I'm going to uh, give you a bit of a left field question over here. The School of Ben, we've just created it, right? Mm. How does Ben approach, um, you know, the, the instruction of attitude um, to, to young people now? If, you, if mm. you could create the perfect school for you, um, you know, what would you encourage kids to do more of, and what would you encourage them to do less of? Jeez, uh, so many easy questions tonight. Um, <laughs> um, one thing I didn't like as a child was um, being told that I had to learn specific things or do specific things when I was like obsessed with other things. And um, apparently it's called ADHD these days or something. Um, <laughs> Uh, luckily, my father strongly rejected the notion of sending me to any kind of therapy um, and told me that um, I was just very intelligent and I need and school was too slow and I needed to figure that out. Unluckily, I didn't figure that out at all and just ended up in detention all the time. Um, but um, what I do wish I had had and what I did have in some teachers um, uh, and in friends and in, um, in my parents, in my family, I've got five sisters from my sisters, from people in my life, um, were people being interested in things that I was interested in. And blowing my mind, going from like, um, you know, almost being a little bit ashamed that I was addic like addicted to computer games 
defining adults who would ask me questions about the computer games that I was very addicted to or obsessed with or loved. Addicted, loved, obsessed, I guess maybe that's all the same thing. Um, and through having someone being interested in it and getting me to think about and explain that was a, that was a passion inside of me. Um, and I could talk endlessly about those things and magic cards and all these like um, things that I did. So I think as a teacher or a parent, I would try use the innate curiosity. Like that's, I think, what school is failing at is it, it just can't discover the innate curiosity of each person because um, it's just too much for the teachers to do that. But AI can, uh, to a degree. But AI is not human, so it's kind of like a little bit of a tricky situation. I must say that, um, you know, as potentially Rory will probably tell you that I'm a, a prime candidate for that whole ADHD thing growing up. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, I, I feel like it's the era of the ADHD kid. <laughs> um, and I, the, the, the reason I believe that, and, uh, you know, is because I have never been so inspired in my life before because everything that is happening, there's just so much of it. And my brain is able to like just go all over the place. And it's actually, it's, it's kind of like a comfortable place for me, weirdly enough, this, this whole AI thing. And I think, I think that that's going to be a benefit uh, to many kids that previously, as probably you had, um, look, the, the, the reality is, weirdly enough, my children went to the, to the very school that uh, was the first school in the world, in England, that um, allowed uh, children from lower classes to attend school. Right? So it's got a big blue plaque on the thing, the historical building and all that kind of stuff. And um, you know, the, the, the thing is that, that in many, many ways, school necessarily has to be the way it is. I, I, I kind of acknowledge that because it's got to cater for you and you know, everybody else. So there is a thing. But I think you're completely right in that at the moment, the way the world is going, it is, it is imperative that there's an acceleration of, uh, you know, experimentation. And there's a, especially in South Africa, you know, South Africa's got a great moment at the moment, uh, right now, where, you know, we, we are almost, you know, like a brand new sort of uh, country where magic things can happen, you know. And what I've always said, in 20, 2012, uh, there were four out of five of the top CEOs in Silicon Valley were South African, right? Elon Musk and, and, and three others, they were all from South Africa. And the thing that South Africa, you know, in my observations internationally, South Africans have been very, very good at is that um, in many ways, whilst we're in South Africa, what we believe the West is, right, and what it really is, is very, very different. In many ways, from a technological point of view, we kind of think that the UK and America and, and those countries are up here. So what we do, right, is we like, God, we just got to get better. So we aim here. And we don't even know that we are way ahead in so many different ways as South Africans. We just don't know it. We just don't know it whilst, we, whilst we're in South Africa. It becomes very apparent when we're outside, i.e. we going to California thinking, what wow, California, you know, Montecito of all places, and they give me a checkbook. I mean, they are people paying for their groceries in America today with a check? You know, where have you ever seen anything like that in your life before? Anyway, guys, listen, what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually open it up now to, to all of you. I'm sure that, uh, you know, we've given a, a few little prompts and there might be some great questions coming out. So please, uh, you know, choose a panelist and uh, fire away. Who wants to go first? Just wait till we have the mic with them. Oh, sorry. Anybody have a question? Just raise your hand so I can find you. Hold on, Rory. Hold your horses. We've got panelists. Yeah, I suppose I think one of the one of the kind of consistent components of this conversation so far has been the future and and rearing its ugly little head is this is this job loss component to it. Um, I suppose from my perspective, at, at the first side of it is looking at it and going, are we looking to create the same kind of world in 50 years time? And I'd be quite hard pressed to, to if we look at our population in a general scope, the answer to that probably would be no. I mean, there needs to be advancement, there needs to be equality, 
needs to be a kind of this band where everyone is able to reach up into. And so when we're looking at the South African economy where we've got 50% of people under 30 years old are unemployed, and we're looking at the state's economy where we're needing to employ 150,000 people every month just to maintain ourselves alongside population growth, I think what, what AI has allowed, I suppose, at a, at a biggest kind of sense of it, is a reimagining of what this world that we are going into looks like. We are not trying to repeat what we've done for the last 50 years, 100 years. We're taking this into a new age of accessibility and development. And, and I think that's what our kind of various worlds are talking to, is how do we actually access that world um, and not just duplicate for the sake of not knowing what else is out there and what could be better. Mm. I feel emotional after that. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, I'd like to go right back to the beginning and make fire. Uh, make fire and reinvent the wheel. And I'm watching my grandchildren as they grow up from infant, because I'm looking at their hands, as my kids did, and I did, looking at my hand, their hands, and then as they grow up, and the fine motor skills that they have in picking apart something, some of them, the others will just squash it down and squidge whatever it was. And I think getting back to, if we take children, you talk, you're talking about children, and I'm talking about children, we need to teach them how to be themselves, to grow according to what their brain is. Some need guidance, some teach us. And learning to read is huge, learning to count the number of people who can't count is the kids who can't count. My kids, my grandkids are very proud of being able to count up to 10. And very soon it's 20 and then it's up to 100. And now they're going way beyond 100 and they're not even four years old yet. And this is, and I also watch programs where this chap goes and sees people who've gone off the grid. And they are teaching their children to feed the animals, to give straw to the, the dog, the, con the goats and the sheep and the horses and the donkeys, and to look after things. Um, we can't all be farmers, we can't all live in an environment like that, but we can teach our children to take care of the environment around them. And I think this is a good building block for future life in being able to analyze what's a good choice, what's a bad choice, what is responsibility, what are ethics, and what are not ethics. And I'm very curious about the lawyer in here. Sorry, what <laughs> your name is? Yeah. Jack. Jack, how does the lawyer, the lawyer daughter, how does the lawyer daughter um, log into evidence. You, know, you get a court case, and I watch a lot of court cases on TV, they're not probably what's in the reality, but evidence can condemn a person to the rest, for the rest of his life behind bars, mm. and the evidence is wrong. I mean, it's been since the beginning of time that innocent people have been jailed, but how can you get evidence wrong? Is AI going to improve this? Yeah, I, well, I, so, I, so there, are two, there are two sides to evidence being wrong. One side is evidence being wrong, and the, the second side is the interpretation of evidence being wrong. So there's, in terms of people being put away for, uh, wrongly put away, the latter is actually the most prevalent component behind that. I think there's a lot of data, which if you look at kind of the, the courting structures, how bringing AI into that landscape actually provides is of consistency and objectivity that isn't determined by did someone get, come to get before the judge before lunch or after lunch. You know what I mean? So, so I think there's, 
ultimately what it's doing in that landscape is, is, is looking at it from an objective landscape, so, or an objective viewpoint. From an evidential perspective, the, the, the capturing of that evidence is always going to be the same. It's, it's, it's not going to, the evidence then acts as the kind of underlying component behind driving the decision making, but it still needs to be garnered or found or captured by someone that understands that unique scenario at its base. We don't do evidence-based courting systems out of interest, but there is a world behind it, and I know it's coming fairly imminently. It just is, and I think it goes back to um, one of the kind of inherent problems with AI that maybe we haven't touched on yet is, is around bias, is around the voice that it's feeding us mm. is based on what? And it is that world that we fed it to train it and to get it to understand our world, is that a just and equal and ethical voice? And there's a lot of contention around that side of it. So in terms of understanding evidence, it's, you're going to provide it with a framework that is objectively sound to the best of its degree, and you're going to train that over time and over time and over time, and it's going to get better and better and better. But to get to that point where it can do that without us, we're going to need to walk these building blocks early on to get to that point. And I think, I think also, you know, the, the one thing that we definitely need to consider is that, you know, evidence can be created nowadays. And, um, you know, so policing of, uh, you know, needs to, needs to really get up to speed with things. Because I saw a video of Donald Trump and Elon Musk, right, doing this <laughs> hip hop dance. And I promise you, I don't think Elon Musk is capable of that, right? <laughs> but it was pretty compelling and it looked like them, you know? So like what, what happens when somebody does use uh, Jack's face and his likeness and his voice because he's a, he's a guy on YouTube and, you know, he's been on TikTok and all that kind of stuff, you know? And then suddenly there's this story of Jack, you know, being this incredible, you know, horrible person that, that's, that gets great joy out of pe putting people into jail. Um, you know, how, do, how does Jack defend himself against something that looks, feels, and sounds real? Um, so I think the answer is in the policing, if I'm honest. I think that that's where it has to happen. Mm. A couple of questions which seemed a bit more profound five minutes ago. Um, <laughs> but the, the, first, the first one was really around um, the fact that it seems to me that our generation um, have got a particular, if you like, optic when it comes to AI in that we've had to do a lot of the thinking ourselves. So here is a tool which can speed up life and make us more productive. But when we think about the education process moving forward, a younger person who perhaps hasn't had to do those processes themselves how are they going to provide satisfactory prompts to actually make AI work for them rather than being fed data and an opinion which actually isn't their own? So what is the, what is the kind of context? How do, I, you, know, you probably don't have an answer for that, but, but that seems to me to be quite a concern. Um, and the other concern is, or maybe the question is around, what is it to be uniquely human? rather than a machine. Um, and when we talk about job losses, perhaps the question is rather, how can AI improve quality of life and what does it actually mean to be a human? I think, I, I think those are, are absolutely key questions and I'll, I'll, I'll hand it over to the panel too. But I think, look, the, 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 the reality is that, um, you know, what is it to be human? Um, I don't know. It's, it strikes me that the process of teaching AI has been mimicked, well, it's been based on the, the, the process of teaching a human. You know, um, here's some stuff you get to know and you get to make a comment on it, whether or not it is guessing what the next word is. But, you know, ultimately what, what we all are, our consciousness and our, our thinking process, etc., cetera, is, is based around input. That it's just the stuff that inputs in. We've you know, and we muggle it around and then we make a, you know, hopefully an informed guess. But um, the, the, the issue around the, the, the critical thinking is such an important one. It is the most important one because it leads to degradation of AI. Because, you know, all of the knowledge that we have is based on knowledge that exists, you know, and when that knowledge starts getting generated by the AI, right, and, and we don't know whether or not that's going to be a step forward, a step back, left, right, or, or whatever, 
you know, that is a very real problem. And, uh, you know, the, the town that I lived in, in in the UK, Winchester, had a, had a school called Winchester College. Not many people know about it, but it is the, um, you know, it's like Eton, Harrow and Winchester College. 50% uh, of their schooling is spent in debate. They, they, they do very little formal education. They spend a lot of time just talking about stuff. You know, and learning, learning, learning concepts. But um, I'm going to go uh, to Pete. What do you think in terms of the, you know, the the, the critical thinking struggle that we might have, um, etc. Um, I think uh, it's it, in education. It, yeah, it's it, some something we've got to be quite careful with. Uh, there's a very cool company actually uh, called Mindjoy that does like STEM education with. Uh, uh, basically GPT models. And what they did, what I thought was pretty interesting is like, uh, they just trained the model to ask better questions. Uh, and like, they won't, if the, if a kid asks the model a question, it won't just give them ans the answer. It will continuously probe them. So it kind of challenges them in a kind of a so Socratic like way, you know? And that's also kind of what we, we do, but more on the, it's the adult education's uh, Different also in workplace training, like it's very specific, like mm. SOPs and stuff like that. Companies want train, but at the at the younger level, I think it's yeah, it's a very very valid uh, thing, and I don't think it's anyone really has the answer yet. I definitely think it's going to be a mixture of uh, yeah, like empowering teachers to use it. Um, one company that we're working with uh, called Masakule uh, basically does ECD, like early childhood development uh, training, and we. Uh, that they sort of use Beeline to um, train like 400, 500 uh, ECD teachers and uh, give them the resources to teach their kids better. Um, so I think, yeah, I don't definitely don't have an answer, but um, I think it can be very, very useful, uh, and it, especially in like Africa where there's a, such a big um, like educational gap. Great. So Adrian, what do you think? I actually really like both of these questions. Um, I, I think, you know, it, there's a lot of analogs to this question, you know, uh, when the calculator was invented, um, the same question was probably asked, you know, uh, how, how will people, you know, will people be able to do, still be able to do arithmetic? And the solution was to take away the calculator and teach them arithmetic. Um, equally, you know, a lot of Gen AI right now can help with software engineering and the consensus at the moment in the software engineering space is that you don't want to let junior software engineers use these tools because they don't have the skill set yet to evaluate the quality of what the Gen AI is giving them when, you, when it, you ask it to code a function. So the answer is to let them learn the hard way. So, and I, I love what you described, Sean, about the school where they spend most of their time doing debate because it means that you're taking away all of the assistive tools and you're just forcing the um, the development of, of critical thinking skills. So I think it, that is likely to be the answer uh, in some form or shape, which is that um, in an education environment, you can constrain what tools are available and to force the development of certain skills that we feel or that we agree, let's say, are very important to have strong functioning minds that can then know how to responsibly and productively and innovatively use the tools then that have been created in the space. As to the second question, uh, you know, what does it mean to be human? I, I have thought about this a lot. You know, I, I mentioned a little bit earlier that I don't think that things like emotional skills and interpersonal skills can, can be offered by AI. Perhaps they can be mimicked, but I'm not convinced that human connection can ever be fully emulated by AI. And already, you know, I think there's this new thing called friend.com, which where the whole idea is to get a large language model to offer, you know, to be a friend. And do you really want that? You know, I, I've i been through a, a tough emotional journey in my life, and I've had to ask myself some s deep philosophical questions about what and how it means to be happy. And the the conclusion of that, this, you know, exploration is, is centered around human connection. And so I, I think what it means to be human is are, are the things that machines can't excel at, and that's authenticity, human, uh, and human connection. And maybe just one final point on that is that in terms of job losses or potential job losses, I kind of feel like, and again, these are all speculations, but I, I think 
even if you can fully automate a job, people still like to deal with people. So, you know, you can buy anything online, but we still have a retail sector. Like, yeah, it's, it's in decline, but people still like the tactility and tangibility of trying on a, a piece of clothing, as an example. It's maybe not the best example, but... So, yeah, I, I think there is a human element of relatability that is likely to persist and stand the test of time. But then just a really quick one, because we're moving over to the next question, but can it be critical thinking without rule breaking? <laughs> 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 I'm, I'm saving these ones. I just <laughs> um, can they be critical thinking about it? I mean, yes. <laughs> um, but I'd like to, because uh, Peter mentioned Mindjoy, and um, I actually invested in Mindjoy, and um, and then I helped them out with a, a project that they did in Zimbabwe, in Big Falls. Um, and it was one school that does um, STEM, which is science, technology, engineering, and math. Mm -hmm. English, uh, engineering, and math. Um, a high school that they basically, the idea was to take mobile phones there and a Starlink um, and a solar panel and take a school which had no electricity or no computers and give them basically super fast internet and um, each kid a mobile device that they can use in the lesson to get information led by the teacher. Um, and I was very skeptical of this. I was like, I don't know why I invested in the company and I'm very skeptical of it, but, <laughs> um, but I was very skeptical of this. This is like going, you know, these kids have never, don't use, haven't used a computer really. Some of them have, but, um, and what we did there was, well, what I saw Gabby, who's the founder do, is she integrated this whole situation into their classroom. So it was 20 minutes with the phone researching things, and then it was 20 minutes of each kid standing up and connecting with the rest of the classroom and explaining what they had discovered, sharing what they had learned about what they are interested in. Um, and the teacher was able to monitor everything that they had spoken about with the, um, with the AI and also help kids that were getting stuck. So it took a whole lot of weight off the teacher because the, the kids were engaged. They weren't and, like, getting detention all the time. They were actually learning about their own interests, converting that into learning into about... So the, the lesson that they taught was actually similar to this panel. What, what's the future going to look like and what do you want to do in the future? So each kid has to, had to investigate what they wanted to do in the future, what it meant to be a pilot or a lawyer or whatever, and then report that back to the class. Um, so it was very interesting. That, and then we went to a school outside of the town, which was... I mean, this school is ridiculous. It's funded by... Um, a, a nearby game park and they basically use it to attract tourists and it's like an activity to go to the school to like plant vegetables with the kids. Um, so it's cool but it's also not cool because um, the kids are basically being used as bait for tourists um, and these are like six-year-old kids and I mean we're standing in the middle of the bush there's lions, there's tigers, not tigers but <laughs> lions and elephants and buffalo wandering around and like we arrive at the school and these kids just like emerge from the bush and I'm like where did they come from they're like neighboring villages like walking past lion and, and buffalo and all this stuff um, and these kids are six years old um, none of them could speak English to me when I tried to speak to them and we gave them each a phone so I'm like this is not gonna work <laughs> and, um, and we first showed YouTube on the first day so um, it was kind of like what animal do you like and um, you know for some reason, they were doing Australian animals. Um, and so we showed them how to look up an animal on Google. And then on the second day, uh, so that was fun, and, but I mean, we're probably going on a bit long here. So on the second day, we took books that they had been donated to them and laid the books out. And we told the AI, each child has a book, ask them to find a word in the book that starts with the letter of the alphabet and go through the alphabet. So they basically got, imagine you're just talking to this child on WhatsApp and saying, go find me a word with that starts with the letter A or A. And they would go find it in the book and report it back to the AI. And then it was like, now go find me, a, or, and it would have a cool response like, that's cool, that's a, um, whatever starts with A, and that's what it's all about. Okay, now go find a uh, word that starts with B. So integrating it into the classroom environment, you know, and not just expecting them to sit on this thing endlessly for hours and hours and just be, you know, this is like, it, it needs to be done in this holistic way. And this is why you can't remove teachers from the classroom. I'm, I'm yeah. quite surprised you didn't have them look up how to avoid being eaten by a tiger. <laughs> <laughs>
So mind, mind blowing experience because these kids, I mean, they were hungry that day. They didn't get food, unfortunately, because the person who gave them food went to a funeral and just decided, well, 150 kids, a funeral is more important than 150 kids eating. But um, they were like locked into these things for hours and having so much fun teaching each other. And they started teaching each other how to talk to the AI. One was getting stuck, the kids would help that one. And so it was just, I was just like totally blown away. This seems very significant to me. Hi, I'm Yolanda Boeta. I teach IT and computer science at Somerset College. And I am loving this conversation and I like your stories. And I keep thinking of the kids in my class and what happens and what's going to happen to them. And I, I um, actually encourage quite a lot of them to come tonight. And I'm really happy to see your faces. Um, but I, I keep thinking, you know, and relating it back to my situation where I am. I, my story, I, I resonate with you kind of in a way that I don't like rules either. <laughs> I, I, if my parents said I'm not allowed to do something, I did it to find out why I'm not allowed to. And the kids in my class call my classroom the Buerta Embassy because other rules apply there. You know, it's not, it's just, you know, the place. And I think, I think that the critical thinking that you're talking about, that, that people should get away from being rigid, rigid doesn't help, and to, to, to encourage the critical thinking in the kids that if they do something else or something other than you would want them to do, to manage that in a way that could be um, positive and exciting, and they teach each other, they, they, the two there, um, and, and, and they're very good at it. And if, if we are going to, in classes, take away, um, you know, because there's lots of talk about, and, you know, globally about cell phones and should they be and should devices be and free time of that. Um, one, I'm, I'm against taking everything away. I'm against banning things. I would like to, to teach, to be able to teach kids to, to interact with, a moral compass um, to find their moral compass but that's where the discussion comes in you've got to talk to people and get their points of view and learn to think and among the ethics chapters that we do everybody wants to skip over nobody, want, <laughs> nobody wants to read the ethics nobody wants to to do any past papers with ethics questions i mean in, in in every year any social implications they don't even want to hear about because they think you know they know and they've been there and they learn very quickly and um, I mean, since I've asked for a chance to speak now, so many other people have spoken and have said a lot of things that I wanted to say and, and, and gone off on tangents. But I think that um, the essence of education today is to teach kids to be discerning with information. They have to, they have to be, because they get a lot and they know everything. By the time they are in my class, they've seen everything. There is nothing hidden from them, ever. They, they have done, they have been there. But how, how should they see that? How should they deal with it? And how should they, that, that moral, I think that is why I maybe landed up in teaching after my whole rule-breaking past kind of thing, you know? And because I understand, and all the ADHD kids are in my class as well. Yeah. And, and sometimes it's chaos. It's chaos, but we, we work hard and we laugh and we play hard and we... Sometimes we cry, and, and you know it's, it, it, it happens. But I think that I wish that that actually every one of them could see um, what happens to people like them in my class, and that they actually that they that they should not be scared to try and to try things and not to be um, scared of any failure. And because they they too scared to try, they too scared to approach, they too they. But just to fail, to fail over and over again, and just to try a new angle and another new angle and another new angle until you make it. And I think many people need to, they need to hear more of that. I, 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 I made a monologue now, but I, but I, <laughs> I agree with you. And, and listen, you know, the, well, thing that's, the thing that you're doing for children is, is, I think, quite critical at the moment. You know, the, the one thing we can't, we can't neglect is the teaching of basics. Right, how do things work in the first place? You know, if the electricity gets turned off right now, how many people in this room know how to, teach, how to, how to make a TV? You know, um, what are the basics of, of that kind of technology and everything? And I think that the, the solid grounding that you teach 
um, you know, by teaching them those, those building blocks of, of this insane technology, no matter how far ahead the technology is, it gives them, it gives them a better way of thinking in terms of, of adapting to that technology. So I, I, I genuinely do think that we should never ever move away from the building blocks, you know. Um, and I'll give you an example of what, what you're probably saying over here in, uh, in terms of education. This is how I think educational future is going to be. It, it, it's in a, a, an analogy, Michelangelo, right? And somebody said to him, how on earth, you know, did you figure out, you know, how to do the Statue of David? And he, and he simply said, well, I just knocked off the bits that weren't meant to be there. Now, I think education should be like that. I think there should be an absolute rule in your class saying, if you come back to me with a small idea, right, I'm not going to listen to you. If it's not crazy, if it's not mad, if it's not huge, right, it is useless to you and it's useless to me. What we will then do once you come to me with your crazy is we'll knock off the bits that are not meant to be there to create something perfect. Too often, we encourage kids to start small. There is no time for small anymore, right? Start big, knock off the bits that are not meant to be there. What do you guys think? Anybody jump in? Yeah, I love what you spoke about with the fear of failure because that resonates very strongly with me. Um, that's something that affected me for a very long time, definitely at school, and uh, it's a very satisfying experience. Uh, I haven't seen Ben in a couple of years, and uh, you know we were at school together, and we were very different people at school. And uh, it's interesting to hear a bit of insight, you know, on, on his experience, you know, being in the school environment and things that constrained him versus what constrained me. But uh, certainly. Um, it is just flabbergasted. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, um, but also I, I, you know, I sit here with with great admiration for you because um, you know coming from somebody who was so afraid to make a mistake for a variety of reasons in school and after school for many years, it held me back so much. Whereas you then have somebody like Ben who seemed like an absolute lunatic in high school. <laughs> But then went into the world with, you know, with zero fear and zero regard to the rules, and has done incredible things, you know, in a very short space of time. So I think that is an incredibly salient point. Um, that, that yeah, I would want to. If there was any advice I could give to anyone in any environment, AI or, or, or no AI, is is that um, uh, fear of failure is is probably one of the biggest obstacles. The other comment I might make is that I'm aware of some research, and I, I can't remember the paper, but. It's about, um, it's linked to this idea of where if your identity is too attached, which mine was, at, especially at school, attached to being an achiever, to being correct, versus uh, being attached to perseverance, well, uh, it turns out that the ones who, are, who, are more, who invest more in perseverance and are willing to try and fail and try again and are more attached to the process of problem solving and learning and iterating end up doing far better in life and far better in in, in um, whatever vector you want to analyze them versus you know the people who just want to you know appear correct and you know that was one of the mistakes that I made in school and it took me a long time to figure out that that was a big mistake. I think I know the paper that you're speaking of because um, I think uh, I came across it uh, probably a couple of months ago where, where they were talking about how how children receive praise and what the impact yes. is. Yes. And, and it turned out that all the kids that were told, wow, you're so smart and you're so great and everything like that, after school really struggled. Yes, exactly. The ones that where parents really emphasized the effort, not the result, um, you know, those kids uh, statistically just absolutely overtook. So well done for your effort, well done for trying hard, well done for going through the, the process, um, turned out better. Right. Next ah. question. Hi. Hello. Um, my question is about... You have to stand up. If you're under 20, you have to stand up. <laughs> my question is about hallucinations within LLMs. There seems to be a sentiment among a lot of prominent AI researchers that hallucinations are a fundamental part of LLMs. I have, for example, I have a quote here from Jan LeCun, who is a prominent AI researcher at Meta, and he says... Um, as I've said numerous times over the last few months, hallucinations are an ine inimitable property of autoregressive LLMs. So I'm curious to know what you guys' thoughts are on to what extent can we 
be reliably building products on top of these systems because you guys are all talking about building things on top of this technology. And I'm curious to know to what extent is the technology maybe fundamentally flawed? So um, the first answer I'll give is, a, is uh, one of the questions we had. You know, I think that people from the older generations, sorry guys, um, uh, we've, we probably know the answer already, that AI is giving us the shortcuts, and if, it's, if it looks wrong, we've got an ability to identify it. Um, look, the first thing I'll say is Meta, and talking about hallucinations, I mean, you know, they're not, they're not got the greatest reputation. So there are, there are good LLMs out there that do a really, really good job. Um, what do you guys think? Who's been really involved in the LLM space? Any hallucinations that you know of in education? And can I talk yeah. about from, from, so from a legal perspective? Um, Sorry, Jack, maybe just explain what hallucinations are. Yeah. Oh, yeah. hallucinations. Yeah. Hallucinations yeah. effectively are... Um, <laughs> do you want to explain hallucinations? No, no. no, 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 no. Sorry, I saw the mic up to your mind. Oh, um... So an hallucination is essentially when an LLM basically starts, well, hallucinating stuff, basically. So instead of drawing from, it's essentially, it's just, it's just trying to sound correct, while none of its facts are actually coming from things within its training data. It's just morphing its training data in ways that sound correct to humans, which is essentially what it's been trained to do. It's when LLMs make shit up. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and obviously LLMs making shit up in a, in a legal context is not something that you really want to be engaged in. Um, and so it was, if, from an ethical standpoint, there was a huge component before we released anything into market was how do we get around the space of there's nothing going out here that we wouldn't, um, we wouldn't provide as advice on our own accord. So in terms of doing that, it means then walking those steps, I think, down to a more granular level. It's not just plugging the LLM at the, on your back end and letting it fly. It's actually then trying to create kind of smaller, slightly more aggressive models that you are then training yourself. Um, and so for us, that meant working with lawyers to question gets answered, answer gets output. Is it correct? Yes, yes or no. And that was just going out into our legal community and, uh, and panelists of the day. And they were then effectively learning the system in and of itself by understanding where this is coming from. So I think you, you kind of, you, you manipulate your, your system to avoid that outcome, obviously. I think it's, it is an inherent quality at this point, unless you are driving into a space of saying, unless you have a definitive answer, provide that or don't answer at all. There, there are alternatives which are to ask more questions, to, to kind of re-prompt within and, and in so doing, drive towards a answer which can't be an listening. So do yeah. you guys, do you guys, um, you know, basically plug into the, the main LLMs or have you got your own kind of training data? Do you, do you, do you give it very strict parameters that, they can't, that it can't go outside of that knowledge base? So both. Um, so the first side of it was um, that we were lucky enough to be part of OpenAI's beta program back in 2021. So we effectively then had to I mean, so what we looked at it from that perspective, which was saying from an intuition standpoint, from a language understanding perspective, um, and from an ability to engage with a reasonable, reasonable degree of kind of rationality, but also intrigue, that, that those components of GPT, for instance, in, in, in initially is what we'll utilize. On our side then, we then had South African legislation, regulation, we trained our own model then against what the input from lawyers was coming back in. So there's kind of amalgamation of these two worlds. One side, effectively looking at both sides for what are they good at. We, we couldn't do the conversational side of it. We couldn't understand, we couldn't do intuition, but we could do precedence and we could understand that this type of question leads to this type of answer. And so we're then able to kind of merge these two worlds together and- Were yeah, the hallucinations really... ever a main <coughs> in, the, in that process? Um, yeah, there were. and. I, I suppose part of the, the issue, and, and particularly within legal, that we found is that people don't, and it's, it's one of our issues in trying to commercialize this as a product, is, is that someone going to GPT and putting in a legal scenario, and coming to us and putting in a legal scenario, they don't know how good the output is. Mm. And so they don't know that it's a hallucinogen, 
and, and unless we going back through and vetting, which we do, but it's still very hard to go back and look at all of them. So yes, but it's it's a it's kind of it's an economic race there. So how, people are using GPT, and so how do you, so it's actually an educational game to now say we need to move people to kind of more niche. And it is very models. prevalent in America. I mean, I know a number of lawyers that are primarily, they're, they're getting rid of parody books, by the way. Yeah, yeah. And they're just, um, you know, kind of using the, the sure. whatever the, the system they're using at the time uh, to do that. Um, Peter, do you have any experience with hallucinations? Is it better? Are they still happening? They definitely happen. I think uh, it's sometimes also, because I mean, humans also hallucinate and get stuff wrong. Huh. So it's almost like, uh, if, is the outcome better, is the system and the outcome better despite those or not? Because uh, if it is, then it's worth it and it's, it's better to have a product with it, you know? So, so it, it, it kind of reminds me of, a, of the other thing as well, the deep fakes is another point is like, as this stuff becomes more prevalent, I think uh, everyone will adapt to it. So, so as, as if, like obviously it's going to cause huge problems, but as those problems happen, people are going to become very mistrustful of videos sent to them, um, you know, because everyone will know, well, this could be a deep fake. So I think people will adapt and we will figure it out. But like, um, yeah, it just reminded me of that as well. Like, I think it's similar to, to this uh, because people will uh, will know that those hallucinations happen. But I guess, yeah, I mean, it, it depends on the, the use case. Um, but yeah, it will sort of, become like doped into the, the into society. Um, ben, it sounds like you're going back to basics with all of this, right? And like, you know, <coughs> kind of going back to the actual deeper understanding of how AI works and its, its understanding of, of how it should work. Um, you know, do you guys have, uh, you know, what are the main problems that you you face when working or researching AI and how it works, etc.? And are hallucinations part of that, that reality? Um, we don't really, oh, well, none of the projects that I'm working on, except for my intro, which is I've got an investor that uh, uses generative AI. Mm. Generative meaning, give me some text, give me an answer, give me an image, give me a video, image, and then it makes it up. And sometimes it makes it up based on facts. And, and if it doesn't know facts, then it starts inventing facts, and it makes it up based on those facts, mm -hmm. which is the problem. Um, and definitely context matters. So it's like, make me a poem. Cool, make it up based on anything. If it's like, what disease do I have based on my blood results? It's like, please don't make up stuff <laughs> based on based on made up stuff. Um, but I, I mean, that's an interesting point to go. Well, there are already cases where doctors miss stuff, and then the person just gets frustrated, and they've seen twenty doctors, and then no one can tell, and they've literally fed their blood results into ChatGPT, and it's identified what they've had, or their dog, or whatever. Yeah. So this is an additional thing to, to the existing methods, and hopefully we will not be solely relying on these things. I mean, that's where regulation and ethics comes in. And now I've lost track of the question, sorry. No, 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 I think you, I think you kind of dealt with it. And, and to your point, actually, you know, my brother-in-law is a veterinarian, and he works for an American company, and all he does every day is look at x-rays and teach the AI what the x-rays are saying. Mm. You know, so so I think there's, there's there's loads of things going. Again, that's not one of those times you want to have an hallucination. Yeah. Right, next question. But there's, there is a, the, 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 like, I can see that people forget that yeah. there's like original truth, and in a hundred years time they just listen to the AI and everything <laughs> well, goes horribly wrong. So, well, 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 so yeah, how do we make the how do we keep the critical thinking, the the, the uh, curiosity, the questioning, the how do we keep the thinking going? I, I mean, I think it will happen. Like also, the other, the other elements is exactly what Peach just said, right? We, we're completely ignoring the fallibility of humans. Mm. And I, mm. I've known some very stupid humans in the mouth. So, <laughs> <laughs> it's not a lot of No worries. Okay, so uh, just a brief comment, having personally gone through it a few years ago, um, I can just say, Ben, you're not alone. The legal ethics exam is still the most frequently failed admission exam. <laughs> um, but then, Jack, my question is to you, and that is, what is the implication for attorney-client privilege when it comes to machine learning in AI? I mean, essentially, it's drawing from the information that is put into it, and that is subject to attorney-client privilege in a legal context. So how do you get around that? I mean, obviously, there's express consent, but... How do you navigate that as opposed to the sort of in-person scenario where naturally your lawyer will learn from their experience? 
Um, do you mean if you're plugging it into a GPT like space or something yes. to that effect? Um, so I don't think that would pass any form of muster. Yeah. <laughs> um, inevitably, I, I imagine what's going to happen within legal spaces is that you'll effectively create kind of ring fence clientele portal where you can engage with that information particular to that to that client, where where it's underpinned by this knowledge base around it. That's like going into a library and if you're opening up your spaces, opening up your pages on the table and finding your books. You know what I mean? It's just is a different way to imagine that. So, I, and from an attorney-client perspective, yeah, I think any any attorney worth their salt is going to keep that on hand. And attorneys love paper, so it's a long time before that becomes. <laughs> Good, everyone. Uh, yeah. So I I guess um, you know, thank you very very much for joining us. I hope. Hope, if nothing else, you've uh, gained a, a slightly better in, insight into uh, this world of AI and you know what the various implications might be. Um, and I guess all that's left to be said is, oh, there's no more wine. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to say something. So, um, Michael Tabra, hi everyone. Did you guys enjoy that? Really good. Can we thank uh, our panelists and hosts? Um, yeah, one of those conversations that could probably just go on and on and I'm sure we'll do another night like this um, in time. But this is the Oak Lounge and so we will have more themes and more of these in time. So spread the word. Um, I think from what you've seen tonight and heard tonight, really valuable. Um, and so, yeah, we'll have lots more. And the other thing is that uh, this is part of the community that we're building. So um, I'm on the Old Oaks Committee, and um, yeah, I mean, in 20, what are we, 26 years of Somerset College, we've got amazing talent, amazing experience um, that has come through and continues to come through. Um, and so, yeah, soon it's going to be you guys. Um, we'll be hearing from lots more in, in the years to come. So uh, really exciting. And just once again, thanks guys for your time. Um, I'm in the horse breeding and cattle breeding business and AI has a very different meaning. <laughs> Some of you might know. Um, but, uh, but yeah, we've got a gift for, for each one. Uh, so once again, round of applause. And thanks to Rory, thanks to Annelien and uh, the college team. This has been recorded, so um, it will be on the college uh, or Old Oaks YouTube channel. Um, so anybody that's interested, send them the link. Um, and thank you guys for coming, really. Uh, that's it. Sorry. One more thing. Uh, while I've got the opportunity. Many of you know about the Acorn Bursary Trust. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's such a privilege to be able to identify uh, previously disadvantaged children and put them through uh, an institute like this. Um, and so, uh, you know, we, we, we raise funds through different means for the ABT, Acorn Bursary Trust. Um, we run a Saturday school program where kids from uh, less privileged schools come and experience this esteemed center um, and the uh, <laughs> little snaps, so you, we, you can donate <laughs> with a snap scan code. Thank you very much, Ben. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so, so have a look, it's on the website, you read more about the ABT. Uh, so lots happening, so, and, and this, is, this is what it's all about, building this uh, community where we can make a difference. Um, yeah, now I'm finished, thank you. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>